We delay the start of our scheduled program to bring you a bulletin from CBS News. The Associated Press quotes an authoritative source in Tokyo as saying that some United States combat troops have been alerted to go into action in South Korea at a moment's notice. According to this authoritative source, the deteriorating military situation in southern Korea may force the United States to commit ground forces to the battle. Now, this bulletin came to you from CBS News. We now resume our scheduled program. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. There's no other end. But they never learn. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment Raymond Chandler's most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Here's a taste treat you can enjoy indoors, outdoors, at work, or at play. The cool, long-lasting mint flavor refreshes you. The smooth, steady chewing helps keep you fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Now with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum are glad to bring you tonight's exciting story, The Pelican's Roost. Hello, Marlowe speaking. Oh, Phil, thank heaven you're home tonight. Lynn? Yes. Lynn Russell? Uh-huh. Oh, baby, when did you get back to town? Uh, yesterday. Phil, listen, I'm at Eugene's. It's a beauty salon in Wilshire, just west of La Cienega. Yeah? Come over here right away, will you? Me? <laughs> to a beauty shop? You've got to help me get out of here. Now, what's the matter, kid? Got your head caught in a dryer? Phil, please, I'm serious. I'm scared. There's a guy waiting for me outside, and when I leave here, I'm, I'm afraid he's going to try to kill me. Now, look, this isn't just for laughs, huh, baby? Phil, this time I'm not fooling. This man's crazy. His name's Ward Erling. I had a few dates with him once. He was in an accident three months ago, just before I left on my cruise. He's supposed to be in the hospital right now, but he isn't. He's here, just waiting for me to leave. Yeah, but Lynn, look, I... I'm not asking a favor, Phil. I'm hiring you. Okay, baby, it'll take me 15 minutes to get there. Oh, thanks, Phil. I'll wait till I see you walk by. I drove out to Wilshire Boulevard and kept telling myself that I could trust Lynn Russell. Why? Because I like her. She was a glossy brunette, born with all the natural equipment of a top model and a covey of oil wells in her own name. She rushed at life, but she'd always been smart enough to stop short of real trouble. Well, it was 9.30 when I got to the section of Wilshire's Miracle Mile that housed Eugene's beauty shop. I drove by, saw no one outside, so I pulled into an alleyway, parked, and walked back slowly. As I passed in front of the show window, I winked at a gilt mannequin with purple hair. And when I heard the door open behind me, I stopped and lit a cigarette. Lynn Russell hurried by without a word, ran to a cab at the corner, and drove away. And that was all there was to it. I turned around, headed back to my own car, and got as far as the handle on the door. Oh! I fell against the car as the blow came again. Oh! It made syrup of my legs. I oozed down onto the pavement and stayed there. I know you. You're Marlowe, the private detective. Okay. So I'm Marlowe. Well, let me tell you something, Marlowe. I've spent three months flat on my back because of an accident that wasn't an accident. I'm going to get even with her, you understand? I don't care what it costs. Palmer Sloan or anybody else can hire a dozen like you, and it won't stop me, so stay out of my way. I climbed up my front fender hand over hand got back on my feet. The time to clutch a glimpse of a new convertible emerald green with what must have been Ward Erling at the wheel. Well, it was no use trying to follow in the condition I was in, so I headed for Lynn's place with all my windows open. The cool air helped. 
I pulled up in front of a wrought iron arch labeled Garden Court Bungalows and followed a flagstone trail back to number four, which was Lynn's. I felt almost normal again until I saw her front door. It was standing half open, framing a man against the dark interior who was trying his best to see inside. This time, the advantage was mine, and I took it! Take your hands off me! Get inside! Oh, just a minute! Get in! Now turn on the lights. Lynn! I doubt she's home. Miss Russell is not in the habit of sitting around in the dark. Oh, you know her habits, huh? I do. And you? I know she has bad taste in men. I wonder if I should resent that. You don't qualify. What are you to Lynn? When she wants someone to help her lift a martini glass, she calls on me. We've been going on like that for years. Just tell me your name, Junior, and he's off on the small talk. My name is Sloan, Palmer Sloan. Now it's your turn, Mr. Muscles. Never mind. Lynn! Lynn! By what right are you snooping around like this? Just who are you, anyway? Here. Here's my card. Lynn hired me tonight. Oh. So you're Marlowe the detective. Yeah, yeah, Marlowe the detective. Any idea where she is, it's important. None whatever. I had a date to meet her here, which never means very much to her. Why did she think she would need you tonight? Because she was afraid of a guy. One who gave me a crack on the skull, and incidentally, doesn't think much of you either. Oh? Ward Erling. Ever hear of him? Erling? Yeah. Uh, well, yes. But Erling's still in the hospital. He met with an accident, you know, something about brakes slipping on a car, and he was, uh... He was crushed. Accident's not what he calls it, and he's got a gun, just for emphasis. What's his connection with Lynn? Oh, help yourself, Marlowe. Lynn won't mind. Get your snoot out of that glass and answer me. She discovered him, like all the others. That sculpted two years ago. And the cowboy, Tex Harrison. Early last year was the fellow with the racing boats, and so on. They are hobbies, fun and games to Lynn. She's got too much energy, far too much. What's the difference with Ward Erling? Well, he fell in love with her. Oh. It was charming. And then he wouldn't be brushed off, told off, or bought off. She tried them all. So? She left. Ran out, took a cruise. He wanted to marry her. Simply wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> Imagine that. Those two belong together like scotch and kerosene. You know, you sound a little like you're in love with her yourself. Maybe I am. Oh. But I know my quaint little position in her life. I'm her errand boy, Marlowe, nothing else. And you don't care how dirty your hands get? What do you mean? Skip it. Now look, errand boy, her life's in danger. Right now, I've got to find Ward Erling in a hurry. Any good ideas? You might try the four-bell jump in Santa Monica. What's that? It's a jive joint on the oh. waterfront at Surf and Wilshire. That's where Lynn dug that character up originally. He's a musician? If you want to call it that. Some do. He was the piano player and leader of a small and, for some reason, successful combination that's still there, so far as I know. Yeah, and one more thing. Lynn left here in an awful hurry. She might be looking for you, and I might later, too. Now, go home, wherever that is, and wait. Why not? Oh, it's 210 in the Beekman Plaza. 210, huh? And if my apartment doesn't answer, try the bar. <laughs> When I pulled onto the parking lot at the Four Bell Jump, the first thing I saw was the nose of the emerald green car Erling had been driving peeking out from the side of a building. I checked it and found out it was registered to one William Freeman. Now, well, that meant nothing, so my next stop had to be inside. The club was a low ceiling mixture of dusty fishnets, the smell of bad bar whiskey, and noise. The band had just finished the set, climbed off the stand, and drifted out to join the customers. I saw the name Howdy Bub Freeman stenciled on the bass drum. He was a flyweight who carried most of it on an oversized head equipped with a pair of protruding yellow eyes. It stuck out even further when I followed him out to a back room. Hey, Bub. Yeah? Is that your car around the side, the green one? Yeah, brand new. Nice, huh? Too nice to loan out. Better come again. Where's Ward Erling? I thought he was the piano man here. Ward, he used to be. He's in the hospital now. Had a bad accident a while back. Who says it was an accident? Well, it was an accident. I say so. Mm. Of course it was. I saw it. The brake slipped in his car. It rolled down an incline, pinned him against the wall. Is that so? 
Who says he's in the hospital? I do. Hey, uh, look, what's your grift? You're a liar, Bob. Erling borrowed your car tonight. Man, you're dragging me. I'll see you around. Come back here! Oh. Look, look, I... I got, I got no beef with you, mister. Where can I find Ward Erling? Why don't you go off somewhere and drop dead? Where is he? Come on, little man, before I shake it out of you. You look like you shake awful easy. Where's Erling? Uh, wait, wait a minute. I don't know. I swear I don't. I don't care if he used my car. I didn't know it. He, he's a bring down, a spook. Keep going. He blew his cork over some society doll. It practically wrecked our combo we've been working five years to build up. Also, it broke the heart of one very sweet kid. Maxine's so gone, she'd scrub floors for Ward and he couldn't see it. I'm disgusted with him. Maxine who? Where can I find her? Now look, little man, do I shake some more? Uh, 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 Maxine Majesta. That's better. She's inside at the end of the bar, blonde in a blue dress. Take it easy, will you? She's a good kid. So am I. We'll get along fine. I'll see you, bub. <laughs> What'll it be for you, mister? Scotch. Oh, that one's taken Lady will be right back. Oh, I'm sorry. Water or soda? Water. There you go. Thanks. Hey, Larry. Huh? Hey, your phone's broken. I didn't get my nickel back. <laughs> oh, you want me to freshen up that drink, Maxine? No, thanks, Larry. This is fine. Uh, Maxine. Yeah? Maybe you can help me. Maybe. Uh, no, no. <laughs> no, what I mean is I'm looking for Ward Early. Try under a rock. <laughs> you know, you sound a little bitter. I'm as bitter as a slot machine these days. What's it to you? Well, I'm an acquaintance of Lynn Russell's. Name's Marlowe. You know her, Maxine? I've seen her at the jam sessions we used to go to. She used to show Ward off to her little groups like a prize pup. Sure you got a peg right? You know she tried hard to shake Listen. Her. She's the got rocks type would sink a yacht just to watch the bubbles. And that's only... Only what, Maxie? Never mind, skip it. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't I get to buy you a drink? Some other Tuesday. Good night. I watched her as far as the door. Decided to go after her, and then I caught the bartender giving me a very cold eye. <laughs> Didn't thaw any as I downed my drink and saw him high sign the bouncer. Looked like my welcome was wearing thin, so I went outside and sat down in my car and tried to figure out who was covering up what. But I only got as far down the list as Palmer Sloan. <laughs> it had come from the back room in the club. I was a poor third in getting to him. A waiter in a white apron and a fat sax man both beat me. Over here, Manny. Here. Hey, it's Bob. Bob Freeman. Holy cats, what's wrong with him? He's been stabbed. Yeah, there. In his neck. An ice pick. Bob. Bob, who did it? No use, fella. He was gone before he hit the floor. Whoever did that to him got him dead center. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you keep going at your best. So for real chewing enjoyment that's refreshing and long-lasting, always keep Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. Healthful, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum will make every day more enjoyable. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's exciting story, The Pelican's Roost. Howdy Bob Freeman was face down and dead. The ice pick that had killed him pointed straight up, rigid like an accusing finger. To the right of the dead drummer's sprawled legs was the fat saxophone player, his face shiny with a fine sweat of fear. And to the left, the waiter who had found Freeman's body. For a backdrop, there was the doorway crammed with astonished faces and the funny kind of cracked voices people always have at a time like that. I closed them out. The waiter objected. No, no, wait a minute, mister. What are you doing that for? We gotta call a cop, sir. Hey, uh, you ain't the cops, are you? No, I'm a private detective. Name's Marlowe. Well, that ain't good enough. We, we gotta get the law Shut about up, this. Shut up, Dave. What? 
Mr. Marlowe will tell you anything you want to know. My name's Lager, Manny Lager. Bob Freeman was a good friend of mine. Even if he's the reason Ward Erling went to the hospital? What'd you say? That from my corner, Freeman dead only adds one way. He put Ward Erling in splints to keep him from wrecking the band by running off with Lynn Russell on a 90-day cruise. Oh, yeah, sure. And to get even, Erling put an ice pick in his neck. Tossed it right from his hospital window. You, uh, you don't keep up with the news, do you, Lager? Erling left the hospital this afternoon, probably what? by way of the fire escape. Water's out? Out. And so that the accident was the kind that's planned well in advance. I know because we've already had a chat. Then you, you mean that Erling did this to get square? He killed Freeman? It could be. But there's another angle. Yeah, an angle named Palmer Sloan. That society louse who didn't want his girlfriend mixed up with anything as degrading as a musician. That's it, ain't it? Maybe. Erling was after Palmer Sloan. All in Russell, he never mentioned Freeman. Yeah, but uh, where's the tie? Howdy Bub didn't fall on that ice pick. Uh, how does it figure? Playing the sheet music was Bub and Palmer Sloan working together. Palmer knew that Erling was on the loose. He was afraid Bub had spilled, so he quieted him with that. Right, Marlo? No, no, I think you're wrong. Both of you, look here. Here, I found this on the floor near the window. This wouldn't right. belong to a man, Mr. Marlow, not even the Palmer Sloan. Let me see that. A mascara case. Yeah. Could be the very personal property of Lynn Russell. Yeah. Her and a couple of million other dolls. You can't hang her on that. Every gal carries mascara. Hold it, will you, Lager? There's a trade name on this case. Eugene, Wilshire Boulevard, Beverly Hills. So what's that prove? May prove you wrong, Lager. I'll see you, boys. <laughs> Marlowe Sloan, have you heard uh, from Lynn? No, Marlowe, I haven't, and I probably won't, so please, let's not call here. Save it for the I'll country club, Palmer, and get a good grip on this. The drummer at the Four Bell Jump's been murdered. Looks like our not-so-sweet friend did it. Lynn? Oh, you're out of your mind. Yeah, I'm out of my mind. Now, tell me, if she did this, have you any idea where she would head? Well, no, Marlowe, no, I, I don't. No. The boat is tied up. Her car is in the garage for repairs. Okay, suppose she didn't take a car or a boat. Would it be by... Hey, wait a minute, Sloan, what was that about a boat? Is it a yacht, maybe? <laughs> Not exactly, Marlo. It's a cabin cruiser. Anchored off the Santa Monica Pier at the moment. Santa and it's Monica? Sloan, that fits. What's the name of it? Crest of the Wave. Why? What makes you think she'd go out there? Well, among other things, a crack a lady made early at night. A lady named Maxine Majesto who loves Ward Erling and hates Lynn Russell. Bye-bye, Palmer. <laughs> I made it to the fog veil Santa Monica Pier in less than ten minutes. Then was another five getting out to the breakwater that joined the end at right angles to form a protecting L for the fifty-yard boats moored within. Boats that ran from the kind of sleek yachts that good girls stay away from to a leaky rowboat with a rusted outboard labeled Faithless. And all were moored in a series of slips connected up front by a narrow, wet catwalk that did not have a guardrail. Except for a quiet old man with his pipe and pass, the end of the pier was deserted. No light showed on any of the boats. When I'd gone along the catwalk as far as the crest of the wave, a neat chrome-finished 50-footer, I had a clammy, uncomfortable feeling that said I was too late. But that disappeared in the next minute when I spotted Maxine Majesta standing alone on deck, her blonde hair damp and flat to her drawn, glistening face, a face that didn't brighten at the sight of me. Marlo, what do you want here? Lynn Russell. Have you seen her, Maxie? Lynn? No. No, I haven't. But you are waiting for her. No, no, why would I... I, I you mean, mean you always come out here nights? It's good for a girl's hair, is that it, baby? Marlo, stay out of this, please. So you can get to her alone? No, Marlo, so I can get to her alone. What? Don't fudge an inch. I mean that, Marlo. This thing goes off real easy. Now, where is she, Maxine? I, I don't know. Oh, Ward, I knew you'd come here after her. That, that's Never why... Never mind that. I want Lynn Russell, Maxine. Why? Why, darling? Oh, Ward, aren't you through with her yet? Didn't she do enough to you? She and that Palmer... Stop it. Just tell me where she is. Keep those hands up, Marlo. I had an itch. I'll ask permission next time. Ward, Ward, listen to me. What difference does it make where Lynn is? She doesn't love you. She never did. You were a five-minute intermission. But us, we were different. We were in love, Ward. We had every time. <laughs> I'm only after one thing, Maxine. Now, where is she? Ward, please forget her. Come here. Get my arm! You're hurting me! I'm not breaking unless you tell me what I want to know. 
<laughs> the guy who runs the hamburger joint the other side of the pier saw her here, Maxine. And for the last time, where is she? All right, stop it. She, she's a pelican's root. <laughs> nice going, Adonis. You got your answer, didn't you? Yeah. Just like I'm going to get Lynn Russell. Hooray. State will be overjoyed. What's that supposed to mean, detective? Something like Lynn Russell just killed Howdy Bob Freeman? You're a liar. Really? It doesn't matter. If it's true, I'll just be a little harder on the fine lady. How hard can you get, kid? Hard enough. <laughs> Ooh! Come now. Oh. Here we go. Up to oh. the sitting position. <laughs> Too much blood to the head is bad now. Come, laddie. Up we go. Oh, uh, there we are. Oh. I'll be fine in a minute. Oh, there's quite the blow there. Yeah. yeah. Hey, take that light out of my eyes, will you? Oh, who are you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I noticed you out on the pier earlier. Uh, the name is Spoon. Elvin Spoon. But they call me Scotty. That figures. Oh. Scotty, tell me. Where's the Pelican's Roost? Was it a nightclub or what? A nightclub? Oh, no, no. It's far from that. How far? What is it? Uh, the Pelican's Roost is the old fishing pier. In Santa Monica? Eh? Uh, a collection of rotting wood at the foot of Second Street? Aye, uh, but uh, what business could a man have there, laddie? The dirtiest. Thanks for your help, Scotty. I, you... Uh, Wait a minute. Uh, let be it. Uh, something you dropped? Yeah. Something I dropped while being dropped. A mascara case I never really looked at before. Bloody, you seem so puzzled. Uh-uh, not puzzled, Scotty, just dumb. Lottie here has been jumping to the wrong conclusions, and all because he didn't take a good look at this and... And what? And the color of a girl's hair. So long, Scotty. Thanks again for your help. May get me to the Pelican's Roost on time. The nickname for the cockeyed assortment of barnacled pilings that complained with every surge of the sea and complained again with the undertow that always followed was no misnomer. At least a thousand sleeping pelicans called it home. Now, as I moved out along the splintered, lopsided boards that here and there gave way, I, I tried to be careful not to wake too many of the birds and stir them to flight, because that would give me away. But the heavy, clinging fog and the waves crashing over the jagged, jutting rocks below were on my side. I made it out to within 20 yards of the end of the pier without being seen. There I slipped my 38 out of my shoulder holster and went forward, a slow foot at a time, until I saw Lynn Russell, alive and alone, huddled near a slick, oily piling, a face in her hands, a body trembling with her tears. What I didn't see was the man who had come up beside me and taken aim. Oh, my hand! How dumb can one man get, Marlow? Beating on the sidewalk, a beating on the boat, and now this. Third time's a charm, Adonis, haven't you heard? Feel your hand, it must hurt terribly. Don't waste your sympathy, Lynn. The gentleman here thinks you're a killer. He thinks you knocked off Howdy Bub Freeman because you and Bub planned my accident. And you were worried about Bub talking too much. Phil, how could you believe that? Oh, it was real easy, Lynn. You had the motive and that plus a box of mascara that came from your beauty shop just about sold me. I don't understand. What about the mascara? Well, it was found near Freeman's body. But it wasn't until a few minutes ago that I found something else. The mascara is brown, and that fits a blonde, not a brunette. What are you trying to say, Marlowe? My guess is that Maxine Majesta is that blonde. She happens to use the same brand as you, Lynn. It's a good guess, Marlowe. <sighs> Maxine. Swell guess. I did kill Bub. We both planned your accident, Ward. Bud, because he didn't want you to ruin everything you two worked so hard for, and I, because I... I, because I'd rather have you in the hospital than with her. Stay back, Maxine. He has a gun. So do I, but I'm still a hit. You see, Marlowe, I got here before you did. I've been watching them. He had all the chance in the world to shoot, but he didn't, and he won't. And that's why you only got shot in the hand. He's not a killer. He only has a killer's temper. And he's just learned that revenge is hollow unless you are a killer. Don't, Maxine. Shut up, both of you. You killed Bob. Yes, I did. 
He was afraid you'd find out everything. He thought his only chance was to tell you what we did and put the blame heavy on me. You scum. You put me in the hospital, nearly killed me just to keep me for yourself. Yeah. It's called love. Stupid, wasn't I, Ward? Selfish. And I lost. But if I can't have you, nobody... She hit those rocks. We've got to get her. Not a chance. Wouldn't do any good if we did. Give me that gun, Erling. Milo, I... Never mind this speech. Go on back to the hospital. Get out of here. Yes. All right, Milo. It was midnight when I called the Santa Monica police, and when all the paperwork was done, it was 3 in the a.m. Lynn and I drove by the old pier and sat looking at the rotten timbers. Tried not to talk about the poor kids somewhere underneath them. Lynn. Yes, Phil? How do you feel about everything? I don't. Just numb. Maybe that's the best way. Numb. Anesthetized. Insulate our hearts, our sensibilities. That way nothing can get to you. Yeah. And then just as we think we're all snug in cotton wool, life explodes the insulation, the heart ends the anesthesia, and we're back grabbing at brass rings. Phil, I want to go home. Okay, kid. But remember... There may not always be a way home. Remember, friends, to make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. There's lots of cooling, real mint flavor in every stick. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, wherever you go, keep some healthful, refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, presented by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, bring you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and star, Gerald Moore. Philip Marlowe is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lillian Bayef, Larry Dobkin, Georgia Ellis, John Daner, David Ellis, Paul Dubov, and Jack Crucian. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's adventure of Philip Marlowe and that you're enjoying Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. <laughs> We invite you to be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time it was a big city, dirty from a trigger-fisted thug in yellow suede shoes. A lady's heart dropped in the gutter and a corpse in a Hollywood duplex. But in the middle of it all and setting the pace was a sweet little girl from Pumpkin Center, Kansas. This is Bob Stevenson speaking, and this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>